Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Musical Inner Tube. I'm Don Rooney. And I'm John Timpain. You know, Don's had quite a career in radio and television, where he's been an air personality, a news anchor, even a TV weatherman. And John's been a college professor. He's written several books, and he's been an editor and features writer at the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper. We first teamed up for a radio show in college. On one show, we introduced a soothing musical interlude. But we stumbled, and it came out Musical Inner Tube. And that became the name for this here podcast, where we talk with interesting people about their interesting lives. Difference makers who really make a difference. And today on the Inner Tube, we're talking with Jason Wright. He's an associate professor of astronomy and astrophysics at Penn State, and a board member and researcher in the Penn State Extraterrestrial Intelligence Center. That's the P. SETI. He's also a member of the Center for Exoplanets and Habitable Worlds. His research centers around stars, their atmospheres, activity, and planets, and his work on SETI searches for the possibility of intelligent life on one of those exoplanets. Jason, welcome to the Musical Interview. Thanks. Happy to be here. Uh, Let's talk about uh, this dazzling thing that you're in, which is looking for life on other planets. You start out um, very scientifically trying to look at stars and seeing if they have planets around them. But we're also looking at uh, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So explain to me, before we get into the exoplanet thing, what SETI is and, and how you're going about doing that. Yeah, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence uh, started around 1960 uh, when uh, some astronomers uh, realized that humanity was creating signals with radio waves that humanity could detect not just around the world, they've been doing that for decades at that point, but at interstellar distances, at planets that might exist around the nearest stars. Uh, and that was a real wake-up call to people that this was something that was that was feasible because it meant that if they had radio telescopes, transmitters, we had a, we had a hope of detecting those. And so um, for the last... Uh, 60 odd years, people have been thinking of ways that we might be able to detect that technology. Um, and uh, the the search has, you know, mostly, especially in the public consciousness, been done in uh, radio waves. There's the phone contact about this. Uh, and that's where most of the searching and money has gone uh, to doing that. But there are lots of other things we could imagine doing too. Um, people have argued that optical communication is a much more likely channel. Uh, and now that we know so many exoplanets around stars throughout the galaxy, uh, we can imagine looking at the exoplanets themselves and trying to see if there's some sign of technology there, like, for instance, artificial gases in the atmosphere, like CFCs or something like that. Um, so, uh, you know, it's exciting because NASA and uh, scientists, astrobiologists around the world are looking for signs of life in the universe. And normally, most of that effort is going into looking for, you know, microbes or biosignature gases that would indicate that there's a biosphere, indicate that there's metabolism going on. Now, what's neat about SETI uh, is that if you if you get a detection and it's unambiguous, then you know you you've you've found everything right you, you there's there's a must there's probably a biosphere there there's probably you know complex big complex macroscopic life and they're using tools and building things unless unless there's a super super bacteria with a radio i mean no i'm just kidding but it, it's an important point that um i mean the the term search for extraterrestrial intelligence obviously we're not we can't search for intelligence right we're not we're not looking for brain waves um and so that, that term is used sort of poetically and uh, functionally. And so Jill Tarter, one of the founders of the field, likes to say that, you know, intelligence is a big topic, but it's, but when, when I say it in SETI, what I mean is the ability to build radio telescopes, whatever's underneath that. That's the functional definition of intelligence, which is kind of funny. Uh, but we should keep in mind that, you know, intelligence is a loaded word and, and we're looking for lasers or radio waves or something, not intelligence itself. Because that's sort of like the trout in the milk. If you get that signal, the uh, whoever is sending them has gotten to the point where they can send it. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, right. But we do have to we do have to be careful not to make too many assumptions about what that means. Just, like it doesn't mean they followed our technology path. It doesn't mean um, that you know they have all the same technologies or structures, social structures we do. You know any of that. All we know is that there's a radio telescope. All right. And that they're putting CFCs in their uh, atmosphere, which means that they're killing themselves, right? 
Well, I mean, it could be. Yeah, I mean, I say CFCs actually because they are extremely detectable at small, at you know, trace levels. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, certain CFCs uh, can destroy ozone, but maybe they don't care about ozone. Maybe they don't need it like we do. Yeah. Um, and not all CFCs destroy ozone. Um, they're they're greenhouse gases, but maybe you know, maybe they're dealing with global cooling and they want those up there. Maybe they did it intentionally. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I, we have a joke here. We we've uh, done a, a couple of programs with a good friend of ours, uh, Matt Kaplan of the Planetary Society, mm-hmm. and we have, we have a joke here that uh, the Klingons are going to come and destroy us because they can't stand "I Love Lucy." Right, because they're getting these old broadcasts broadcasting uh, our entertainment out into the ether and, and getting who knows what kind of reaction from people who, on the other hand, may pick us up. That's right. We've been leaking our our own existence through uh, radio transmissions. And, you know, as we become a more wired world and stuff, some of that's going down. Um, we don't, you know, do as much radio transmission, we, you know, fiber optics and we like optical communication. Um, on the other hand, other stuff is going up. You know, we have aircraft radar uh, and, you know, Starlink, right? That's that's microwaves up and down. And so, yeah, we're we're still leaking a lot of stuff out there. When in the 1960s, they talked about this, the the strength of the transmission would have to be extremely high for them to have detected it. And so, you know, it was sort of an optimistic best case scenario where they took a, a 100 meter telescope and a megawatt transmitter behind it and pointed it right at Earth. And it was just always on all the time. And that was all they could detect at the time. Uh, now we're, we have more sensitive equipment. We can search more channels. Um, and we're getting, we're about at the threshold where if earth, if there were a perfect clone of earth around alpha Centauri, Mm -hmm. that we have a hope that we might actually be able to pick up all that, all that radio chatter that's going on and and not direct it, which I think is sort of a second watershed moment in the field. If I could step back for just a moment. Um, so about, I don't know, 15 years ago, I had a nice long, uh, talk with Phil Morrison and yes. uh, talking uh, you know, talking about, you know, the origins of uh, SETI. And for folks who don't know, uh, Phil was a scientist who, uh, who was involved uh, in the Manhattan Project, which uh, uh, created the, the first nuclear bomb, but also was uh, a speculative scientist uh, and was really drawn to the notion of SETI. And I asked him a bunch of questions, and I realized, uh, listening to you now, that in the last 20 years, there has been so much... Uh, just an explosion of knowledge. Uh, we never used to use the word exoplanet, for example. Right. A- and now it's really part of our uh, daily bread. You know, we know there's there's hundreds of them. Can you talk about, for example, uh, what uh, the uh, you know the new telescopes that are out there uh, can see, which we didn't we weren't able to see before? Yeah. No, that's really neat that you interviewed um, uh, Philip Morrison because he. Uh, he's who I was talking about that started this whole thing in his paper yes. with, uh, Coconi in 1959, uh, is what brought it into the public consciousness. Simultaneously, Frank Drake was already doing it. He was building the, the receivers to do it when they published that paper. Um, yeah, the, um, the discovery of exoplanets has, has really changed the game because, uh, before 1990, 1993, 1995, uh, we didn't know if there were any planets around other stars. We just had to assume that since our sun had planets, other stars did too. And so, you know, they would typically just kind of point at stars like the sun and hope that stars like the sun had planets like the Earth. Um, and and so when people thought about the chances of finding life in the universe, they usually did it along the lines of the Drake equation, which just tries to estimate, you know, how many might be out there in terms of things like what fraction of stars have planets, what fraction of those planets are habitable, and so on. And those, you know, we don't know the numbers. They could have been zero, they could have been one, we don't know. And so along comes the discovery of exoplanets uh, in the mid-90s, and then more recently with Kepler, the the Kepler spacecraft that NASA launched. Uh, we now know that virtually all stars have planets. And we estimate that something like a quarter of stars like the sun probably have planets about the size of earth that might be at the right distance to have liquid water. And so that number is still a little fuzzy. Um, but you know, whether it's, you know, a quarter of all planets or a 10th of all planets or a hundredth of all planets, either way, you're still talking about billions of sites for life throughout the galaxy. 
uh, and you know maybe hundreds of billions of sites for life. And that means you know if if life is a thing that inevitably happens when you have the right stuff in the right place, and life started pretty early on Earth, so you know we have reason to think that might be true. Then life could be really abundant. I mean, the nearest stars could host life-bearing planets, and that's made the hunt for life a lot more uh, plausible. The other thing is, it's given us targets. Like you know, we're building space telescopes now that can plausibly actually measure things about these exoplanets. We're not just detecting them; we're characterizing them. And some of the things we'd like to measure are biosignature gases, and you know, <laughs> what the reflected spectrum looks like. Is you know, is there chlorophyll all over the surface of the planet? That sort of thing. Um, and so that has made astrobiology much more plausible. It's no longer purely speculative. Like, you know, we're actually designing missions to go find this, these things. And that has helped the search for extraterrestrial intelligence as well, because the, you know, the argument is that if life is common, then, you know, some fraction of them, as we know here on Earth, will develop intelligent species. Earth has many intelligent species over its history. And some fraction of those intelligent tool using species will perhaps build radio telescopes or spacecraft or whatever. Is SETI now still only looking for radio waves? You you, you mentioned all of the uh, advancements that the telescopes have given us and looking at the gases around a planet and, and that sort of thing. So is, is, is SETI still only devoted to trying to hear radio waves from uh, exoplanets or, or is the, is there a more complex way that you're looking for life on other planets? Yeah, I mean the 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 term SETI originally just was the name of a NASA program uh, that was primarily focused on radio waves, um, but uh, and 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 it's also the name of the SETI Institute, which is a research center in Mountain View, California, that runs the Allen Telescope Array, which looks you know for radio waves. Um, but I use the term a lot more generally, just to you know refer to any attempt to find technology. And when Coconi and Morrison published that paper and uh, Frank Drake made it known he was he was looking. Right away, people started suggesting other ways to do this. It was really a catalytic moment. And so um, Charlie Towns, the inventor of the laser, uh, yeah. immediately published a paper that year that said, hey, optical communication uh, would work even better. Uh, and this was before he'd even built an optical laser. Like he was still in the <laughs> microwaves. And he's like, right. don't worry, we'll get it and it'll be great. And you could use that. And he was totally right. Um, Paul Horowitz at Harvard, uh, who you might know because he wrote The Art of Electronics, which is kind of the right. Bible of, of electronics, um, he really got into this and built a lot of uh, microwave uh, spectral analyzers to help with things. But he also uh, really took the idea of looking for, for lasers to the next level and had several students work on um, optical laser flashes and doing, doing searches for lasers. Um, and in fact, I'd say most of the work in academia on SETI was, was done at Harvard by Paul looking for lasers and not radio. Um, and then in the same uh, year, 1960, uh, Freeman Dyson uh, argued that we should be looking not for deliberate communications, but for the byproducts of uh, industry. Um, he said, if you're going to, if, if, if they're doing things, whatever those things they're doing are, um, the starlight that they collect to power those things that they do uh, will turn into heat, and we should look for heat around other stars that might be indicative of that. And so that's grown into the idea of a Dyson sphere, uh, which we could talk about if you like. Uh, and then, yeah, we mentioned chlorofluorocarbons around planets. That one's that was very new because we, you know it hasn't really been possible to do that. But um, but just in the last fifteen years or so, people have been. Um, thinking harder and harder about how we can find stuff around planets. So a lot of these ideas have been around as long as the field has. But you're right, um, it, it radio dominates. And the reason for that is that it was the first, and then again, NASA was briefly um, supporting it for about 10 years. Uh, and then, uh, well, not even 10 years. Um, and then when Congress cut off funding for that, it had to move into the private sector, or the philanthropic sector. And um, the and and then it, the most of the work, uh, the direction most of the work took got dictated by the people with deep pockets, and so that's what captured you know the the imagination um, of uh, of Barney Oliver, who was a founder of HP and left a big part of his estate to 
endow the SETI Institute. That's what captured the imagination of Paul Allen of Microsoft, who funded the Allen Telescope Array. Um, and most recently, uh, Yuri Milner has been funding mostly radio work with the Breakthrough Listen Initiative. Uh, and so, I mean, it's a broad field, but you're right. Radio has dominated bec just because of historical accidents of what's gotten funded. Back to the search for intelligent life on the inner tube in a moment. But first, this soothing musical interlude. New discoveries from the Kepler Space Telescope indicate that half of all stars may harbor Earth-sized planets, many within their star's habitable zone. Drawing on Penn State's existing expertise in infrastructure, the PSETI Center provides the administrative framework and, most crucially, the funding needed to elevate SETI research activities to an entirely new level. Jason Wright specializes in stellar astrophysics and making precise radial velocity measurements of stars to detect the exoplanets that orbit them. He finds and characterizes new planets around other stars using the Hobby, Eberly Telescope, and Keck Observatory. You can learn more about his research on his blog at sites, that's S-I-T-E-S dot P-S-U dot E-D-U slash AstroWrite. That's Astro, W-R-I-G-H-T, his last name. You can also follow him on Twitter at Astro underscore right w-r-i-g-h-t and now back to the musical inner tube so one of the things i wanted to bring up uh, is the scale on which we're talking uh and this is again a product of having spoken to phil many years yeah. ago and i said to him and again this is 15 years ago this is when people were still downloading uh, a screensaver Right. Uh, yeah. You SETI know. at home. Yes. SETI at home. And, and exactly. uh, I, sh I should explain what this is or was. Do people still do that, by the way? Is that still a SETI thing? SETI at home is on hiatus at the moment, but I think okay. you can still get the software. Right. Yeah. And so what this was, was people at home could download a screensaver and you would be sent little nuggets of information from the main SETI uh, center and your computer could analyze it for signal. And so... In a sense, with all the thousands of people who did that, you had one of the largest uh, computers in the world working on this huge problem. And speaking of huge, um, I asked Phil uh, during this interview, I said, so, Phil, uh, some people would say, OK, it's 45 years now we've been looking for something and nobody agrees that we've found anything yet or very few people do. Uh, sure. So how long do you think it would take? And Phil said, oh, you know. I, I expect something in, within 150 years. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then we both laughed. And, and I said, so that's how big this thing is. And he says, yes. I mean, look, I think that in our galaxy, this is what Phil said to me, a very low estimate of the number of developed civilizations in our galaxy is 7,000. It's a very, very low figure. This is what he said. I said, well, what about outside the galaxy? And he, he laughed and he said, the mind fails. We can't even go there we can't well first of all we can't go there anyway which is what he told right. me <laughs> but he said that the scale of this is enormous suppose we get a signal well the signal has got to be a few years old at least right uh yeah because we are constrained and we assume that others are constrained by the speed of light and other physical laws it's a pretty safe assumption <laughs> yeah yeah exactly i mean unless somebody's been able to defeat it uh yeah. which would be and and one thing Phil did say is that I really think that by now, if there was something like uh, the Galactic Empire, the evil, uh, you know, masters of all, we would have found them <laughs> or they us. Right. Because, right. you know, uh, there isn't there isn't anything like that that we've seen so far. But really, what I'm trying to say is this is huge. I mean, this is so huge. And the notion that we could actually find something to sink our teeth into right away really is an operative because we're just dealing with distances and uh and even our own uh the physical and uh, technological limitations which i know we're exploding all over the place all the time but it's still true we're limited um this means that really we're this is using a comb to comb through the ocean which is you know another thing i heard a person from seti saying you know uh and i'm just wondering you know, your comment on that about, you know, the, the notion of distances and size with this. Yeah. 
I think when a lot of people imagine SETI succeeding, they imagine it'll be like in the movies that we're, we'll be having a conversation, you know, that we'll get the signal, we'll answer back, and like we'll learn stuff and we'll commune with the aliens and, and, and so on. Um, I think it's much more likely that we're just going to know they're there. Like we'll just see that there's some radio chatter around a different, a distant star. Um, and as you say, the distances are large. So even if it were something like a signal, like please answer back and we'll have a conversation. Um, you know, the, the latency there is enormous. Even if it's the nearest star, as you say, it's four, it's eight year round trip to, right. to talk to them. Um, and so, uh, it's, it, yeah, that, that's one place that the scale, uh, comes into things. Um, it's more likely we'll find something I think that's more distant. And so we'll be talking more like centuries long round trips. So just, just studying these, even if there's communication is an intergenerational project, um, but as I said, I don't think the communication is very likely. I mean, we have intelligent species that we share evolutionary descent with, very close, you know, evolutionary relatives like dolphins that are clearly communicating with each other and yeah. we can't figure out what they're saying. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, right, so right. the problem of interspecies communication is really, really hard, even in the best case scenario of, you know, us trying to communicate with other mammals. So I'm, I'm skeptical. Now, it's possible that like the language of mathematics will turn out to be universal. If they can build radio telescopes, they must know radio engineering. So we know we have that point, you know, in common. common, maybe, yeah. maybe we will be able, we will be able to work it out. It's possible. Um, and then, yeah, there could be a lot of species out there throughout the galaxy. The other way it gets big, um, is that, you know, l technology can spread. We want to count how many planets might have life. Well, in the solar system, there's, as far as we know, one. There's one planet with obvious life that you can see from a distance. But if you count the number of, of sites of technology in the galaxy, well, we know of at least four because we've got robots on Mars and we've got robots around Venus. And, you know, we, we've already spread our technology through the solar system. And going to other stars, the big problem is how long it takes. That's the only, that's the only difficulty. It just takes, a, you know, hundreds of thousands of years we don't know how to build a machine that lasts that long um but you know that's that's just engineering <laughs> um, it's just an engineering problem it's not a it's not physic there's no physical limitation that yes. prevents, prevents that yes and so you know give us enough time give them enough time and why why not why can't mm -hmm. it spread eventually um, right eventually but once it starts spreading what's to stop it Yes. And so, you know, you just need one technological species that starts spreading and then, you know, the galaxy is the limit. There could be way more sites of technology in the galaxy than places where life arose, just like is now true in, in the solar system. So, yeah, it's pretty mind blowing how, how much could be out there. Um, the upper limit here is very high uh, and that, that, that keeps me optimistic. We, uh, I'll remember a couple of years ago when that uh, object was floating around the sun that uh, some people said was artificially created. Right. Um, and, and it just, it got me to thinking about the fact that we have sent uh, um, uh, machines out, which are now past our solar system, the Voyagers yeah. and that sort of thing, uh, which are now hurtling through um, space beyond our solar system. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it got me to thinking, again, if there is a species out there that is as advanced as we are and is indeed putting out probes, and one of them escapes their solar system and comes towards us, is that a possibility? And are we looking for that mm -hmm. sort of thing as well? Yeah. Um Y yes, that that would be really interesting, and uh, people have thought about how to spot interstellar objects in the solar system, either passing through or that have been captured uh, gravitationally, or have just parked themselves here. Uh, and and more importantly, how to distinguish them from just asteroids, which is challenging. Right, <laughs> that was um, the big thing with that with that Oumuamua. Yeah, yeah, Oumuamua, yeah. Uh, yes. I, I was going to say his name, but I knew I'd get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with Oumuamua, uh, Avi Loeb suggested that it was a, a, a piece of a light sail or a light sail, uh, mm -hmm. a very thin, you know, thinner than mylar sheet uh, that was used to propel a spacecraft uh, riding on a beam of light or on starlight, for, for, perhaps. And um, 
uh, you know, most people who study interstellar objects and comets are like, it's a comet from another system. The, the challenge there is numbers. Um, you know, we think when, when star systems form, uh, well, we know that they must produce enormous numbers of comets that they then spread, uh, the planets kick the comets out of the system and they then spread throughout the galaxy. Um, some of them are given a kick not quite strong enough to leave the whole system. Um, and that's where we get our Oort cloud and all our long period comets come from. But most of them will leave. And so the galaxy is just littered with comets. And it's, it's, it has been expected for decades that eventually we would have the capability to detect these, these comets that fill the galaxy as the solar system passes through and they, you know, we run into them. Do they um, have a different, if I can ask, do they have a yeah. different um, uh, composition signal? Are we, we able to? Uh, that would be very interesting to learn. You know? Oh, okay, okay. That so would be that's great. great. <laughs> that's a, We've that's only a seen question. two, and they're yeah. super tiny and faint. And and so um, we're, we're waiting for their plans now that we know their rough frequency and that they, we should, with the new Rubin Observatory, start to detect these kind of maybe once a year and ish. And with that frequency, we could imagine sending something out to intercept one of them and get close enough to actually make measurements because these things are so tiny. They're not like Halley's Comet. They're really, really small and they're very hard to, to find at all, much less like get composition. But that, that'll be very interesting. Of course, you know, people who think these might be interstellar, you know, probes are even more excited about going to see them and see what they are. <laughs> but um, the thing about the yeah. numbers game and, you know, every star system is putting out, you know, millions and millions of these comets, which is why we have a chance of seeing some of them. If these are probes, you need similar numbers in the galaxy that, you know, just churning out billions or hundreds of billions of these probes that one of them might pass through. Um, and, you know, that's a lot of probes. Maybe. Who knows what's out there? Um Another reason that we might look for them, though, is that they're deliberately targeting specific stars. Like, why send a probe out randomly, right? You yes. should send it. It'll go somewhere. Um, and so uh, Joe Lazio has made the argument, like, let's say that we find around a nearby star that there's life. You know, right away, people are going to start talking about how can we build a probe to go study it? Like, we're going to do that. And, you know, maybe it takes a million years to get there. And we're like, well, maybe we can make it go a little faster. Like, you know, what are the options of building something that could go? And, you know, we don't know how to do that now. But you can imagine in a few hundred years that they're building a probe that would take a thousand years to get there. Is That's, it, yeah. you know, something you could imagine a long-term scientific project for. Sure. And so if you think that way, you know, the solar system's got plenty of cool planets. It's got one with life on it. Who's, you know, why wouldn't there be a probe doing some sort of study of the solar system just hanging out? Um, there isn't anything in Earth orbit, as far as we can tell, because we've cataloged that pretty well. But there's a lot of space in the solar system and uh, and a lot of places where a small probe could be that we never would have noticed it. And so, yeah, people want to look through the whole solar system to see if something might be here. One well, other question. I mean, all of this is just so cool. All right. Uh, so I have two things. First of all, uh, can the Webb telescope um, find a signal for water in an exoplanet? Can it Can it do that? Yeah. Um, sort of, but not maybe the way you're asking. So if there okay. were a, a planet like the Earth uh, around a nearby star, JWST would not really have the instruments we need to say, oh, there's water. There, that has oceans. Okay. Um, that's not the kind of telescope it is. There are... There are a few cases where JWST can study the atmospheres of some exoplanets nearby in special circumstances, um, but uh, but but not really like an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star with oceans right. and stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. there are other telescopes being planned, uh, the next generation after JWST, that are designed to uh, to actually image planets around other stars to actually see that dot of light that that pale blue dot and look at the reflected light and say hey there's water on the surface of that thing um That's so cool. yeah definitely you know during my career i expect at some point we will be testing other planets to find that and we'll be having you back on the musical in a tube <laughs> to discuss that when that happens i mean and it'll be in all the newspapers that's the other thing you know uh, yeah. when it when it happens i mean 
I guess I know that, uh, uh, you know, several scientists have said that one of the biggest problems we have is suppose we get a signal, which is persuasively a signal. Mm-hmm. The question then is, what do we do in response, mm-hmm. if anything? And right. Hawking said, go slow. <laughs> that was his. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the, and uh, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that, you know, because so, many people would leap out of their shoes and say, say hi, wave hello, you know. Right. Or, Absolutely. You know, you know uh, but uh, some people say, well, uh, you you got to got to think, guys, uh, you know, but w- what's right. your feeling about that? Um, I, I think. It's important to plan for this kind of thing and understand what the issues are. I personally think it's extremely unlikely that we'll be like, you know, communicating back and forth. Right. We've talked, um, yeah. And so I don't think the external consequences on what they think of us are going to matter much because, you know, if they can understand our radio waves and stuff, well, they've already been getting I Love Lucy, like you say, <laughs> you know, so they've already figured all that out. And, um, and, uh, otherwise, I think what's much more important is managing people and understanding, you know, why you should or shouldn't, you know, represent all of humanity or include humanity and and think about, you know, how humanity represents itself in the galaxy. Mm-hmm. Um, some people are worried that if we, you know, communicate with them that, you know, that they will learn about us and like, you know, it'll be like War of the Worlds or Arrival yeah. or, you know, some science fiction and it matters what we say because it could lead to like intergalactic war or whatever. And I don't, I, I don't think that's very likely. And I don't worry about that at all. Um, you know, the distances are very large. It takes a long time to travel. Yeah. They know all about us already. They can't understand us anyway. I'm not worried. Um, but yeah, but, but people uh, do worry about how humans will react. Interestingly, um, there is a paper where people asked about religion and, you know, whether it would like upend people's notions of religion mm-hmm. and roughly what the, an- they, they didn't say, you know, how do you think people that are religious will react? They say, you know, what is your faith? How would you react? And then they'd ask about other faiths and like, how do you think they would react? Mm-hmm. And people um, of faith that were asked about their own faith were sort of uniformly like, yeah, that's cool. Whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, right. You know, the Vatican astronomer has to deal with this all the time. Everyone wants to know how, like, Catholicism will handle, you know, there being other souls out there. And they're like, yeah, that's cool. We'll figure it out. We've, you know, been talking about this for centuries. It's not yes. a big deal. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. But it, when they asked uh, atheists what they thought, they, you know, overwhelmingly thought that this would, like, you know, upend all the world's religions and cause all these religious crises and stuff like that. So it's interesting that the people, you know, that actually are in those religions don't think that's true. So I don't think that's a huge issue. I mean, obviously there are small, like apocalyptic cults that will jump on anything. And I'm sure, I'm sure that that'll be there, but you know, most people on earth either don't care or, um, or think we've already contacted them. They'll be like, you know, yawn, the government finally admitted it. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right <laughs> yes. right um and so uh i don't think it'll be as big a a social i don't think there'll be social upheaval i think it'll be like you know landing on the moon or something everyone was like wow that's just amazing wow yeah but you know you still go to work the next day no that's right i mean you got to pour your own cornflakes after you've heard right. I mean, it's, you <laughs> right. know exactly <laughs> definitely <laughs> no i'm just saying that that you know it's funny i know what they mean if you let yourself think about it, we are all going to have, if if something like this does happen, whoever is around when that ha- does happen, it. Th- some people are going to feel like the last 10 minutes of uh, Close Encounters, you know, where yeah. people are, you know, right. slack jawed and going, oh my goodness. It, right. I mean, it's going to be a wonderful moment. Uh, you know, why people would think there would, there would be social upheaval in general, I mean, who would you be upheaving against? What, <laughs> yeah, what, right. what would you go throw a rock at? Oh, there's other people in the world. Give me that gun. <laughs> it's a, <you> know. <laughs> I think people imagine, though, that if there's communication, that something will change. I think they imagine that, you know, we might, we might learn, learn things that we can use here on Earth. Some people imagine that, you know, they will teach us to be a better species and that, you know, the, 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 the shared, 
you know, perspective of, you know, humanity as just one species in the galaxy, um, you know, will help bring about more of a global consciousness the way that like global warming has and the way that pale blue dot has and so on, that it'll continue that and be very good for humanity. Um, some people think it'll be bad that, you know, they'll teach us all this great new physics and that there will be this then military race to weaponize all that physics and that it'll turn into, you know, a geopolitical strife and that, like, you know, people will try to monopolize communication of the aliens to, to, to do all of that, which, again, I think is extremely unlikely. Um, and so I think it's important that we make sure that, you know, the people that think that way and have the power to do something about it, you know, the generals and so on, that they, that they understand what's going on, that they understand what SETI is, they understand that sending troops to an observatory isn't going to help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. the radio waves are hitting the whole planet. Like, <laughs> yes. it <doesn't, laughs> it's yeah. not this tight it's a, beam just there, you know? Right, right. And, right. and, it, and, and it, it, it just brings to mind the original Star Trek where every episode Kirk was saying, we are a peaceful people. Now let me beat you to a pulp. You know, I just, it's, <laughs> right. It's the peaceful never, federation. Every scene has a every every episode has a fight scene. Has well, exactly. a fight scene, right. even though Kirk con constantly says we're pe we're here to we come uh, in yeah. peace. With, come in peace. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, Jason, let's talk a little bit about you for a while. How did you get involved in all of this? And and let's talk about the fact that the SETI Center is at Penn State. Now, those of us right. who live in Pennsylvania consider Penn State a big ag school, agricultural school. How did uh, SETI wind up at Penn State, and how did you wind up uh, as part of uh, the SETI program? Yeah. I mean, Penn State, of course, is a major research university and, and just has excellence across, you know, all of all of academia. Um, the, uh, the Eberly College of Science is, you know, one of the top science colleges in the, in the world. Uh, then we also have the uh, College of Earth and Mineral Sciences, uh, which does planetary science and geomicrobiology. Um, and, you know, in addition to, you know, coal and oil and, and, and that more, you know, mining center origins that it has, you know, today leads uh, cutting edge stuff on the origin of life. We have one of the only um, astrobiology graduate programs in the world. We're one of two places in the U.S. that you can get a Ph.D. in astrobiology. Wow. Um, and, uh, we have one of the top astronomy departments in the world. We have, um, probably not the largest, but we're definitely top three, I think, in the size of our astronomy faculty here at Penn State. Um, and we lead, uh, in exoplanets as well. I, I, um, we have, uh, the Center for Exoplanets and Habitable Worlds has many faculty and graduate students, um, and we've built some of the most precise p planet finding instruments in the world, which are now being used uh, at the National Observatory in Arizona and at the Hobby Everly Telescope in Texas, which we're partners in. Um, and so it's kind of a natural place to do all of this because we uh, have for decades led on understanding life in the universe and the origins of life on Earth and how it might exist elsewhere and in finding a exoplanets and understanding their prevalence throughout the galaxy. Um, so it's kind of a natural extension to do this. Now, on the other hand, <laughs> most effort on finding life, like I said at the top, is about, you know, microbes. It's not about uh, technology. Uh, and, but if any place was going to do it, 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 it should be Penn State. So this actually um, started, our center started when uh, John Gertz, who's the uh, former chairman of the board of the SETI Institute in California uh, approached us uh, saying that, you know, because of the work I had done in SETI and because of Penn State's excellence in all of this, that Penn State would be a great home for a big endowment to, um, to make sure the field had a continued presence because it's so hard to get federal money for it. And so that started a, a, a fundraising effort here at Penn State to try and and get that going. We've had a couple of estate pledges already from alumni uh, who have put us into their into their wills uh, to help endow the center uh, in the long run. And so, yeah, we're very grateful uh, for the alumni that have done that. Uh, but in in the meantime, um, the Eberly College of Science and the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics uh, are you know have have given the center some seed money just to get started. And so um, we have. 
Uh, we support a grad student or two to do research in the field. We have developed a graduate curriculum. And so now students getting their PhDs can take a graduate course in SETI, um, which is the only one of only two standing graduate courses on the topic anywhere in the world. Um, and we've also been doing an annual symposium. We had our first one this past summer. It went great. Uh, and the idea is to give SETI an academic home and to create a, an annual forum where people getting into the field are already in the field can participate. But it's a very, very small field. Um, there, there are very few people that can say they work on this full time. And so we're trying to grow that. We're trying to train people in it. We're trying to get it going. So um, it's it's been fun uh, building this center up and watching it grow. Uh, and, um, it's been fun, you know, doing all of this new SETI research and trying out new SETI ideas and publishing SETI papers and organizing the SETI literature and finding a canon of papers in the field and doing all the things that universities are good at, um, turning an idea and a practice into an actual discipline, mm -hmm. uh, which, which is something I think the field has lacked, uh, because there's been no federal money for it. And, and <clears throat> when you were a little kid, did you find, uh, worms where you didn't think there were going to be any worms? Is this how you, how you started looking for life on other planets? <laughs> um, no, I, uh, I, I mean, I've always been interested in astronomy. I've always wanted to work on that. And I've always enjoyed science fiction. I went to graduate school at Berkeley, uh, where a lot of people closely connected to Radio SETI, uh, were working. It's where SETI at Home was developed. Um, it's where they developed the um, hardware for the Allen Telescope Array. And uh, and Jill Tarter was often around uh, because uh, her husband was a, um, a Berkeley radio astronomer. And, uh, and so, you know, I knew there's Jill Tarter, the, you know, one of the founders of the field, who's, who's, who, who works on this stuff. And, uh, but I didn't think about getting into it until quite recently. Actually, um, my my graduate advisor at Berkeley had briefly given me a, a SETI project that we might do together. I said, "Oh, that's kind of a neat novel thing." And I we we quickly worked out within a day. I think that the idea would work, but it stuck in my mind. And then uh, uh, several years ago, here we were watching a talk about a new uh, space telescope called Wise that NASA had launched, and in looking about reading about the data products, I was like, wait, that's what I needed back in grad school. If we had had this telescope, then we could have done the project. So we, uh, we applied for some money from the Templeton foundation. They gave us a small grant to try the idea out. I really enjoyed that. And in, in doing that project, I realized that, you know, the literature was, was strewn about and hard to find that it wasn't a discipline that a lot of, you know, easy, basic stuff hadn't been done with that idea. And so that got me started on it. And that's what got the attention of John Gertz, who then came and the rest is history. I think we should, I think our listeners should realize that most of the time that Jason has been talking to us during the past half hour, he's had a smile on his face. So this is a man <laughs> who not only enjoys what he's doing, but it's clear that you get a kick out of a lot of it because it goes so many different places. I mean, we started with you making this distinction that there's a big difference between looking for life and looking for intelligence. Yes. That, that, but that the two, you know, obviously are going to cross the two searches. They're going to parallel, you know, you probably can't have one without the other. So it's they're going to happen in kind of the same places, but they're, they're different. And, um, it's so fascinating to hear that you've really sort of been present at the creation of a discipline. Yeah, I hope so. That's yeah. That's our, our ambition is to really make it a new discipline. Well, thanks very much, Jason Wright, for being with us today. Uh, yeah. we know a little wow. bit about how, uh, how you're looking for life on other planets and how you're looking for other planets. That, that's kind of cool. And we're hoping that uh, one of these days we do make contact uh, or, you know, at least hear that there is something else out there uh, one way or the other, whether it's uh, that they're destroying their ozone layer or <laughs> or that they they can't stand I Love Lucy either way. It's going to work out. Or they're out. just asking for a cup of sugar. You know, either way. Yeah. What can I say? Either way. Jason, thanks very much and continued success and let us know when you find something. All right. Sounds good. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for listening to The Musical Inner Tube. Check out our website at musicalinnertube.com where you'll find all our episodes 
profiles of our guests, and lots of extras. You'll even be able to leave us a voicemail. Our email address is musicalinnertube at gmail.com. On Twitter, our handle is mintertube, capitalize the M and I. The Inner Tube is available on Facebook, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, and iHeartRadio Podcasts. Like us and give us a good review on any of those platforms. And as always, thanks to virtual band Car Radio Dog for our theme music. Music.